Welcome to Taiwan Talks, bringing you a Taiwan perspective on global affairs. I'm Albert Cho. Today, we will discuss President Biden's plan to send weapons aid to Taiwan and improving South Korea-Japan relations. These are possibly aimed at countering China. Joining us are uh, Chen Fang Yu, Assistant Professor of Political Science uh, at the Suzhou University, and Raymond Song, Deputy CEO of Taiwan Constitution Foundation. First of all, uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask the question to Raymond. The U.S. plans to fast track 500 million USD worth of arms to yeah. Taiwan yeah. during the Presidential Drawdown Authority, so-called yes. PDA, for military assistance. So could you explain to our international audiences what uh, PDA is? Yeah, PDA is Presidential Drawdown Authority, which is the authority given to the President of the United States to uh, forward, to expedite military aid, security aid to countries which its views needed. Mm -hmm. And it was, has been used to aid Ukraine up to now for thir 37 mm -hmm. times. And now it's uh, uh, provided to Taiwan at the amount of $500 million um, security aid. Actually, it's not new, and it, sh it was already provided uh, by the Congress in the uh, near the end of 2022 in the passing of NDA 2023, which says that in addition to the security aid promised to provide you to Taiwan, and the president is authorized to use PDA to forward uh, uh, aid from the existing stocks of the Defense Department and services, and also from the inventory of any governmental agency to uh, provide uh, to Taiwan, and which is uh, timely and more flexible to, uh, to meet the current and the most immediate security challenges. So would you say that the PDA uh, policy is sort of like a uh, privilege for the president to kind of detour the congressional oversight? Uh, if there's any kind of opposition from the Congress that you know, probably the United States shouldn't provide that much weapons to Taiwan. It's, it is an expedite channel, mm -hmm. and, but it's authorized previously advanced authorized given to Parliament, in this case, okay. in the uh, legislation and DAA 2023, mm -hmm. and also, and it's uh, authorization for the president to meet immediate challenges. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, the Congress control is more in the ex, um, uh, ex post facto mm -hmm. uh, basis. Okay, all right. Uh, so finally, so since uh, President Biden took office, the U.S. has provided uh, military aid to Taiwan. So what is the U.S. provided so far? Could you kind of in a laundry list a little for our uh, audience? Well, overall, there are several uh, major arms sales from U U.S. to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. That includes some weapon systems, including uh, the self-propelled Hawaiser, and also artillery ammunition supply vehicle, and also the volcano mine system for defense of the coastal area. And we, uh, Taiwan got several advanced missiles, including the Sidewinder air-to-air missile, mm -hmm. and also the Harpoon anti-ship missile, and uh, uh, anti-radiation missile, and the uh, advanced medium-range air-to-air missiles. So, and we also get a lot of tech support and uh, uh, equipment mm -hmm. and components for the warships, tanks, and it, it is basically uh, includes the overall uh, defense capability of Taiwan. And besides that, Taiwan also got a, a cooperation uh, from the U.S. Uh, to our uh, to, to our training systems, mm -hmm. uh, including all uh, the army and and for all of the different uh, armies. So so that that is uh, the U.S. is now uh, having a, a close ties with with Taiwan in the uh, issues of the defense. Right. Uh, we all remember that in the beginning of the Ukrainian war. Uh, there was a lot of requests from the domestic Ukrainian society for the supply of a war plan from the U.S. Uh, made uh, war plans, right? But the, the question was whether or not uh, the, uh, flight, uh, 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 the soldiers over there, they were able to uh, kind of operate the flights. So, you know, would you say that we also have the, that, that type of problem in Taiwan, that if the United States now finally is willing to provide us, us with advanced uh, you know, weapons like that, but can, can our technique or skill catch up with the uh, weapons itself? I think if you look up into the, the items of the arm cells, that include that include a lot of different uh, the maintenance support and also the training uh, programs mm -hmm. in in the in the uh, in our arm cell plan already. So mm -hmm. and Taiwan and the U.S. has been uh, close ties 
on the cooperations on the uh, training si uh, training systems mm -hmm. for a very long time. So, mm -hmm. so I am not worried about that, especially for uh, for the uh, advanced uh, weapon systems. Right, because more or less more compatible in you know, between the United States and Taiwan. And also, like I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, do we see any pattern of change uh, in uh, the you know the nature of the military aid to Taiwan? Yes, uh, so in, in recent years, especially from the Trump administration, we see the, mm -hmm. a normalization of the arms sales process. Mm -hmm. That is, we not, uh, the, the arms sales is now very similar to all, all of the other countries. Mm -hmm. Before, before the Trump administration, we always got the arms sales uh, by a package uh, a process. That is, uh, we got the arms sales for a very long time, mm -hmm. and then a lot of uh, different items mm -hmm. get reviewed in, in just one time. Mm -hmm. But right now, we got item by item review. Mm -hmm. So it's just oh. like very similar to other countries. That is, mm -hmm. I think it's a positive sign for Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And the second is that we see a so-called porcupine strategy mm -hmm. of, of Taiwan. That is, we get a lot of uh, advanced missiles and or, or uh, the artillery uh, supply vehicles, some, something that is highly mobile mm -hmm. and highly, uh, I mean, they can survive uh, in, in the beginning of the war so that we can have very, uh, we, can, we can fight back, we can mm -hmm. defend. Mm -hmm. So that is not for attack, that is for defense mm -hmm. specifically. Mm -hmm. so, so we want to, uh, and we get a lot of advanced mm -hmm. uh, uh, the weapons from the US. So, mm -hmm. so that is, that reflects that the U.S. is now considering uh, 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 increasing a threat from the uh, China, and mm -hmm. also chi uh, the U.S. is really want Taiwan to uh, increase the uh, capability of defense. Right. Okay. Uh, so Raymond, uh, the successful utilization of the 500 military worth of arms provided uh, by the United States to Taiwan will require Taiwan's input, of no. course. So yes. what step, in your perspective, can Taiwan take? To enhance the collaboration between the two countries. Now, thank you for the question. I would like to echo what Fang Yu just said. Mm -hmm. It's not only a matter of equipment, but a whole system of how to increase or mm -hmm. strengthen the Taiwan's capability to defend itself. And uh, for that, it's called for modernization of Taiwan's forces mm -hmm. and also for uh, providing the availability of the a range, whole range of equipment to to attack, to counter all kinds of uh, tactics used by the, P the uh, People's uh, Liberation Army, mm -hmm. including the gray zone activities, and also for long range uh, aiming and attack capabilities to anti-ship or anti-aircraft. All those kind of uh, factors has been put into consideration. So the key words are the modernization of Taiwan's uh, capabilities and to provide Taiwan with equipment, training, and also to deepen the cooperation of uh, Taiwan's forces and the, uh, the allies forces, including the United States forces, and including uh, to increase the uh, possibility of uh, interoperability of the two forces to carry out uh, common missions or to uh, anti-advance uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, activities. So also, on the other hand, all those deepening of cooperation also put Taiwan's defense into uh, more stringent scrutiny mm -hmm. from the U.S. side. Mm -hmm. And the, in the NDAA National Defense uh, Authorization Act of uh, United States 2023, it has to, the defense of uh, department, defense department has to review the Taiwan's capability and the spending, whether the uh, Taiwan's increase its defense spending to uh, its own uh, capabilities uh, promotion and mm -hmm. also whether those activities is realistic and useful. And so we, we, we would like to welcome the deepening of the cooperation and communication of the both sides, but also uh, we, ha we need to utilize those pressures to really improve our own capability to defend right. ourselves. That's what we should do, right? Okay, so, Yu, so China has been known to react strongly to the U.S. providing Taiwan with such military aid. So what has China's response been to this recent arms sales so far, uh, you know, as your observation there? Uh, for this time, I mean, for these uh, mm. several arms sales, China always responds with very strong words. But mm -hmm. I think China is now taking an overall strategy uh, mm -hmm. toward Taiwan and also for the U.S. Okay. And not only for Taiwan and the U.S., but also for other countries as well. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as the countries want to make 
better relationship with Taiwan, then mm. China will uh, use the economic sanctions mm. or some diplomatic approaches to uh, against uh, these countries. So I, I don't uh, observe any specific mm. response this time. I mean the latest uh, mm. arms sales, but mm. also, but they always they are always utilizing different kinds of uh, ways to coerce. Other mm. countries, maybe it's just too frequent, you know, yes. this kind of uh, you know aid to Taiwan, yeah, so that it becomes known to yeah, yeah, okay, all right, uh, interesting. Okay, uh, so Dennis Ong, associate professor of political science at Sam Houston University, has helped Taiwan Talks interview Michael Hansker, associate professor at the George Mason University's Shar School of Policy and Governments. As a scholar of Taiwan security, let's hear what Professor Hansker has to say on the country's future. Michael, let's start with the recent announcement of the uh, 500 million military aid package from the U.S. to Taiwan through the presidential uh, drawdown authority. We'd like to know what is your analysis of this aid package? Terrific question, Dennis. I think it's an important piece of news, and my assessment is that it is a big net benefit for both Taiwan and for the United States. I would offer three reasons I think it is an important and positive development for that relationship. I believe it's tangible, it's practical, and most important, it's fast. And by that, I mean, when I say it's tangible, I know the United States and especially Washington have been going out of their way to provide rhetorical support for Taiwan. We're hearing lots of speeches coming from the Senate and the House floor. And as you well know, and people in Taiwan know, we have a never ending stream of congressional representatives going to Taipei. And these are useful, but they also don't necessarily give Taiwan anything meaningful that can actually improve its ability to defend itself. And so there is always that risk of poking and provoking Beijing without actually helping Taiwan prepare itself. This, however, is giving Taiwan something that it can actually use to improve its defenses. I think it's practical because the sorts of things that the United States would give as part of a so-called presidential drawdown authority are things that we already have in our stockpiles. So things probably like body armor, and munitions, which brings me to the third net benefit, is that these things can show up quickly. It's going to be fast. So unlike a lot of the arms sales that typically dominate the airwaves and the news about the U.S.-Taiwan relationship, those sorts of things like HIMARS, they take three, five, ten years to actually make their way to Taiwan. Things that we draw down from existing U.S. defense stockpiles are things we can send very quickly, which is why this is something we've been doing a lot with Ukraine of late. On to our second questions. What is your assessment of the current state of U.S. and China relations? Tensions are rising. The trend lines are not pointing in a great direction, certainly not a lot of optimism, I think, by those of us who are trying to watch the situation unfold. I would, however, say, and I think this is a very important caveat, given some of the rhetoric that's coming out of, out of D.C. in particular, that although Conflict is a risk. I think it is a very real possibility and one that I hope Taiwan takes seriously. I also do not think, firmly believe, that war is not inevitable. So yeah, the risks are there. And I believe that Taiwan does need to take meaningful steps to improve its own defenses. The United States is clearly also working to improve its ability to help Taiwan in a crisis. But ultimately, I believe that in order to reduce tensions, it will require a political bargain a political compromise, one that Washington, Taipei, and Beijing can all agree to live by. I would definitely say that as tensions continue to rise, it will make it more difficult, trickier for all three sides to come to that consensus. But what I would definitely warn against are for those in Taiwan who think that it would be better for Taiwan to not improve its defenses, and that will somehow make it easier to strike an acceptable bargain in the long run, because anybody who's ever engaged in bargaining knows you do not want to bargain with a quote-unquote weak hand. And so the best thing I believe that Taiwan can do right now is focus on improving its defenses in the near term. I think that will ultimately help improve cross-strait stability by decreasing the risk of conflict, by raising the costs, and convincing Beijing it's just not worth taking the risk. Is there anything Taiwan can do and immediately instead of wait and see well, what Taiwan can regarding the practical way to actually strengthen Taiwan's self-defense? Could you please uh, you know, share some thought about this? I do not believe that conflict is inevitable, but I do believe that an important step in order to reduce the risk is to improve Taiwanese defenses. What I would strongly suggest for those who are interested is that Taiwan can do a few things and it can do them right now. The first is to emphasize 
the training of Taiwan's military forces, and in particular, its ground forces, its army. And I think the United States and Taiwan have made a lot of very important steps just in the last few months towards improving U.S. security cooperation and training support for Taiwan's ground forces, both by sending trainers. I really do believe that Taiwan needs to continue to push for important defense reforms. In particular, I would like to see more done in terms of realistic and rigorous reserve training, as well as an attempt to put some meaningful support and organization behind what many American advisors refer to as a territorial defense force. And then finally, I very much hope that the Tsai administration and even the Taiwanese people are putting a lot of investment time and energy into stockpiling because it's a well understood risk that Beijing could attempt to blockade the island. And even if we went to a worst case scenario, worse than a naval blockade, but a full scale invasion, it will just be very difficult for the United States and Japan and other regional allies and partners to support Taiwan in the midst of that crisis. Let's now talk about the historical relationship between South Korea and Japan. Uh, Fang Yu, uh, would you please uh, kind of briefly talk about the historical relationship between South Korea and Japan to our audience? Well, the two countries have been in a very nervous relationship, relationship in recent years. Mm -hmm. And I think this is due to the unresolved disputes mm -hmm. uh, stemming from uh, Japan's colonial occupation of mm -hmm. Korea in 1910 to 1945. Mm -hmm. And for decades, both countries uh, tried very hard to try to uh, compensate this uh, history. And they did make some agreements in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. So that af after a, a decade long uh, negotiation. Mm -hmm. However, after that negotiation, uh, Korea, mm -hmm. uh, the, due to the domestic politics, uh, right. for example, in 2018, the court uh, just overturned the, the uh, agreements mm -hmm. uh, with, with Japan. So, so J J Japan just saw South Korea as an untrustworthy mm -hmm. uh, partnership because they uh, just uh, break up the, uh, the agreement for several times. And also, uh, Korea sees Japan as uh, uh, they never apologize for their uh, for their brutal uh, rules mm -hmm. in the colonial occupation mm -hmm. uh, area. So, so these two countries, and I, th I mean, during the sev uh, past several years, they got a uh, trade war be between each other. For mm -hmm. example, Japan uh, had uh, 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 a ban on the exporting the essential chemicals for the semiconductor mm -hmm. uh, industry for, for Korea. So, so, and this happened several times, just uh, back and forth, several mm -hmm. times for, for the two countries. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so like in the past 12 years, that means that 2018 was the lowest point for this bilateral relation between the two countries. Okay, uh, so Raymond, um, uh, how has the disputes of the war history affected Japan-South Korea relations? Uh, you know, perhaps the war really brought up a lot mm. of traumatized yes. experience on the people of South Korea. As, as you were, you know, what do you uh, The two countries has a long mm. and complicated history and uh, many, many issues they are facing now mm. are historical root, uh, of historical root, especially for issues like uh, the compensation for the victims of the war, including mm. uh, sex slaves, mm -hmm. a couple of women, mm -hmm. and also for the forced laborers of uh, Koreans. And uh, of course, uh, many, many times, the, the both countries have tried to find some regime to deal with those issues, including 1965 in the normalization and compensation agreement. And uh, Japan provided a uh, $300 million uh, compensation fund to compensate the victims. Also, uh, for the specific issue of uh, comfort women, uh, in 2015, the another fund was uh, funded mm -hmm. to compensate the victims. But uh, uh, some issues I've seen affected by the domestic changes in uh, Korean domestic politics, for example, when uh, President Moon Jae-in was in power, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, public opinions forced him to effectively end the 2015 uh, agreement. Mm -hmm. So one uh, issues, uh, but uh, it's noteworthy that both sides have tried to narrow down the issues they are trying to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so as to specifically aiming at solving uh, problems that uh, to uh, remove them from the, their progress of mm -hmm. the alliance building or security cooperation. Mm -hmm. So one example is uh, this time when the uh, President uh, 
Yu met with uh, Prime Minister Kishida. Mm. They agreed to uh, set up the fund and to reinvigorate the fund. Mm. And but uh, the Korean companies instead of Japanese company will provide the, mm. the fund ne necessary to uh, for those victims. And also, mm. uh, Japan has already agreed to lift the export restrictions on mm. the essential chemicals. Mm. So this. I will summarize it as a narrow down and uh, more pr to provide, to enable both sides to more specifically uh, addressing the issues that still uh, remains to be tackled. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's a saying that uh, the Japanese government in the past always uh, resist, you know, or deny the wrongdoing they did in World War II. Uh, of course, not only to South Korea, maybe also to Taiwan too, or maybe to China. You know, uh, is it? a possible different way of assessment of this kind of saying that maybe from right wing you know uh, parties yeah. in Japan like LDP probably they have a different way of uh, make apology or you think that you know this kind of saying makes sense that you know this is kind of a, a, a touch area for Japan for the Japanese government not to uh, recognize what they do if uh, we compare to what the German Germany has done mm -hmm. and of course we can say that Japan is more reluctant mm -hmm. uh, to uh, forthright, come out forthrightly to apologize for what the Japanese Empire mm -hmm. did in the war. But we have to take into account the cultural dif uh, differences okay. and also the uh, very complex factors underlying those uh, mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. And but it's not a, uh, to provide an excuse for the Japanese society, people has to bear accountability, but I, th I will argue that all the Eastern Asian countries, including Taiwan, Korea, and Japan, are dealing with the uh, lesson of um, uh, transitional justice, mm -hmm. how to face one's past, mm -hmm. and uh, how to find accountabilities for the justice, for the wider justice, and how a country who suffered from wartime activities from others deal with its past and how to you find the in additional um, historical archi archival materials mm -hmm. and to find the truth and how to deal with all your past and how to cooperate with with one another to find our common uh, future that's the lesson common to uh, the countries in this region okay. I would argue fine do you have anything to say about this well, I think it's very mm. difficult for the two countries to make uh, some mm. uh, agreement to or to advance their cooperation because these are long-term narratives mm. in each country. So, mm. for example, in, in South Korea, then it is uh, a brutal colonial uh, mm. uh, rule right. there. Yeah. And also in, in Japan, there's, yeah, so South Korea also accused Japan of not sincerely apologizing mm -hmm. uh, ever. So, so yeah, it bec because, yeah, there's no such a, a I, I mean, that lacks uh, uh, transitional justice and lacks a uh, uh, very basic foundation of discovering what happened mm. in the past. So, mm -hmm. so the very f basic uh, elements of the transitional justice just never happened mm -hmm. in, in Japan and also in, in South Korea. So uh, there's just a lot of things to do. Right. And also, I think in the domestic parties also mm. play a very important role. So mm. uh, according to a poll, nearly 60% of Korean people oppose such a tie with, the Jap with Japan, okay. calling this a, as a humiliating diplomacy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but Mr. Yoon, uh, apparently uh, South Korea's president, he shows the ambitions of uh, becoming a globally important mm -hmm. big country. I mean, right. South Korea want to play a bigger role uh, mm -hmm. in the international party. So mm -hmm. they, they know that it's very important to cooperate with Japan. Mm -hmm. And Japan also, I mean, the latest Time magazine is using, using the mm. uh, Prime Minister uh, Kishida as a, a, as a cover figure, right? right? So Japan is also having a, such a plan or strategy to becoming a, a real big power <laughs> in the international party. Mm. So, so they know the importance of cooperation. How did the recent developments, such as the South Korean President uh, Yong Su Yok's visit to Tokyo and his promise to reinstate in Japan onto its trade wireless help improve the stalled ties? Well, I think it's a very good sign of, of the cooperation. But still, they uh, both leaders face mm -hmm. a, a very uh, big difficulties in their domestic politics. Mm -hmm. For example, in Korea, more than 60% of Korean people oppose such a tie with, the, with Japan, mm -hmm. calling this is a, a humiliating diplomacy. 
However, I think uh, that has something to do with their long-term narratives in both yeah. countries. So for example, uh, just, just uh, as we mentioned that Japan never apologize for, for their, uh, what they're doing in their, in their em empire era. And also South Korea insists that the, uh, Japan should apologize and should compensate to the forced laborers and, and others. So if, for example, for the Japanese companies, if they make voluntary uh, donations, then it certainly means something that to admit Amid their uh, both wrongdoing, so still there there's a long way to go. But I think there's a, a, a very good sign of a beginning, mm -hmm. especially under the pressure from China and the dynamics mm -hmm. of the international politics. So mm -hmm. I would say um, maybe we can be optimistic about the development. Let's now hear from Casper Weitz on the historical reason underlying disputes between South Korea and Japan and how this contributed to major diplomatic tensions between the two nations in 2019 and 2020. He is a university lecturer in the Institute of Area Studies at Leiden University and previously a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Cambridge. Let's take a look. The deterioration of South Korea-Japan relations in 2019 and 2020 was caused by economic and historical grievances. Can you provide an analysis of the factors that contributed to the escalation of tensions between the two countries and the specific economic and political actions that each country took in response to the licensing uh, procedure? The immediate trigger, I think, for the uh, disputes uh, between South Korea and Japan that started in 2019 was a... Uh, decision by the Supreme Court in South Korea, uh, which happened in October 2018, uh, so in the year previous, uh, where uh, the Supreme Court in uh, Seoul decided that Japanese companies had to pay uh, reparations, uh, individual reparations to uh, laborers who had worked for them in the colonial period. So uh, that means in the, in the period between 1910 uh, in 1945, when uh, the Korean Peninsula was uh, uh, colonized by, uh, by Japan. And in 2018, basically, the uh, judiciary decided that compensation should still be paid for those victims by specific Japanese uh, companies. And this created a major diplomatic dispute, because according to the Japanese government, uh, this issue was already settled much earlier in 1965, 1965 uh, being the year that South Korea and Japan re-established their uh, diplomatic relations. Uh, when, at least according to Japan, it was decided that then reparations uh, would be paid, uh, even though they would not really be called reparations, but would mainly take the form of like loans and grants, etc. Uh, and um, like an, in that uh, agreement in 1965, also compensation for individual victims uh, should have been dealt with. So that was sort of it uh, at the basis of modern relations between South Korea and Japan. So this issue is settled. Uh, but now that courts in South Korea have decided that it was not settled, so this resulted sort of in a spiraling uh, out of control of, a, uh, uh, of the dispute between South Korea and Japan. And very quickly, what started as a labor dispute, dealing with uh, issues past, morphed into a trade dispute. And as things went from bad to worse in 2019-2020, the, um, the then president of South Korea, Moon Jae-in, uh, also threatened to, to pull out of uh, certain uh, bilateral and trilateral with the United States, Japan and South Korea um, mechanisms for sharing intelligence. That didn't quite happen. Uh, but it does show you like how out of, uh, like very much out of control this whole thing uh, became. Apart from actions that were taken by the government, there were also a lot of actions taken by ordinary people. Like uh, in South Korea, the Boycott Japan uh, movement started among ordinary citizens uh, and so on and so forth. And most, like the important thing to keep in mind though is that this might have been triggered by this decision in 2018. Of course, we're basically talking about uh, damaged relations between South Korea and Japan that have their roots much earlier, uh, basically in the colonial period, and in the feeling among a lot of South Koreans that um, proper restitution and proper uh, contrition has never uh, been paid or shown to uh, South Korea by the Japanese. So there's this extreme bitterness, and we tend to see whenever there is a South Korean president in power, uh, from the progressive side, 
uh, this dispute tends to get out of control very quickly. Uh, and uh, in important meetings back and forth, the Japanese prime minister visiting South Korea and vice versa, or the South Korean president and visiting Japan, um, shows that this dispute is now finally getting uh, resolved. But uh, the underlying uh, problem is that w whenever another South Korean president might get into power, this whole thing might be uh, once again, uh, might once again blow up, you know? So um, the uh, relations between the countries are now finally picking up again in a positive manner, but who knows how long this will take. We will now dive into South Korea-Japan economic relations and what role Taiwan has to play. So I guess the first question uh, goes to Fang Yu. So what is the uh, significance of the economic security dialogue between Japan and South Korea at this time? Because they just had this uh, a while ago. Uh, would you say that the two economies are interdependent or there's a room for dependence from each other? I mean, inter independence from each other? Well, I think there's a, there's a sharp turn of mm -hmm. the, the uh, relationship between two countries that mm -hmm. they just got started uh, the trade war in 2019. Mm -hmm. And they quickly uh, solved this dispute and uh, lift the, the uh, trade war uh, and, the, the, and the export bans. And in, in this February, they talk a lot on the high-tech corporations, including the areas of biotechnology, the space, and mm -hmm. some uh, key uh, cooperation on the semiconductor uh, mm -hmm. industries. So I think this, uh, this plan is in, in line with Americans' plan of making a, a mm -hmm. economic supply chain alliances not only in the in the US in the in in the Indo-Pacific region but mm -hmm. also globally mm -hmm. so i think this is uh, not only because the, the two countries has not been uh, interdependent on each other but also is a, a, in a bigger picture to just to compete with china well i think that's an excellent point because speaking of the supply chain in chip making uh, raymond do you think that it is likely to reply, replace the supply chain uh, kind of you know, demand from uh, for oh. Taiwan to continue to supply within the United States the chip making. Yes, I uh, think resources. in the yeah. movement of uh, securing the more safe uh, mm -hmm. safety and in the and more stable supply chain, especially for the high tech products, including semiconductors, mm -hmm. both I think all the Japan, Korea, and Taiwan was part of it, and also uh, would be. Uh, all three economies have been coordinated by the U.S. to into the uh, this this movement, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, th all three of them can cooperate with each other mm -hmm. as well. Uh, this is a in a more uh, like Fang Yu just said in the um, uh, against the bigger picture to mm -hmm. uh, secure a, a, a safer supply chain for the U.S. and the, all those. Uh, advanced economies have been uh, integrated into it. And also in terms of uh, Korea and Taiwan, we are supplementary uh, in a sense to each other. And uh, of course, uh, Taiwan is more advanced in the mm -hmm. uh, sophisticated appliances and electronics, and uh, in especially semiconductors. But uh, Korean's economy is more broadly spread over, for example, the other industries, including the heavy industries. So we, uh, both Taiwan and Korea, are at the one hand in competition mm. relationship, mm. and the other hand um, uh, on the supplementary, mm. complementary basis to each other. Mm. So it's uh, inevitable, one, in one sense, it's inevitable uh, movement to uh, integration and coordination. And in other, in other sense, this uh, adaptation to a new uh, economic situation on the global scale. So I guess uh, you would agree uh, that um, the inter integration would not uh, sacrifice the advantage, uh, say, TSMC already enjoyed in the past, because that's going to be urgent for you know the companies like TSMC <laughs> to upgrade, right? Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it might be a, a little bit dangerous. TM TSMC uh, is a special case, and mm -hmm. uh, it's the chairperson of mm -hmm. the TSMC has made this uh, repeatedly clear. Mm -hmm. It's a very integral to the what this uh, Taiwanese system mm -hmm. can provide. It's a whole system, it's mm -hmm. not uh, only uh, factories. Right. And it's uh, relating to our culture, our education, and the work uh, load and the work schedules mm -hmm. and work spirit. And it's difficult to be repeated in 
elsewhere. Okay. But uh, of course, we can try. For example, TNCMC has I installed its uh, factory not only in Japan, also in America. Mm. And, uh, and uh, Samsung is also catching up with the competition. Mm. So uh, in, in a sense, it's a part, both Korea and Taiwan are team members of the chip four, mm -hmm. and but they are in competition mm -hmm. at the same time. We've been talking a lot about the uh, Japan South Korea relations, but you know there is a role that we can never neglect is the United States. Yes, yes. So how, how would you evaluate the United States input in this bilateral relations? Yeah, I think the United States are very eager to see the uh, deeper or closer cooperation between the two most important uh, allies in East Asia for for it. Uh, Japan and Korea, and uh, actually it has played its part. For example, mm -hmm. uh, we all know that the United States government Biden administration tried very hard to mm -hmm. draw this summit to happen mm -hmm. and to get a bridge between the two, co two countries. And uh, for that, it's also promised uh, President Yoon mm -hmm. a high-level Washington visit mm -hmm. uh, on the con or if he could uh, carry out this uh, rapprochement between uh, Korea and Japan mm -hmm. also in the history and uh, uh, America has been very very eager to build alliance to uh, in East Asia mm -hmm. uh, including building of uh, uh, court mm -hmm. dialogue and also the five I uh, mm -hmm. alliances and the, there now is the talk to for the Korean to join the court mm -hmm. uh, to, to make it a five partner five members partnership mm -hmm. and also historically and um, United States have been pushing for this for quite some time for mm -hmm. example the 2015 agreement for the compensation for the comfort women and it was carried out by mm -hmm. Kishida himself mm -hmm. as uh, the foreign minister of Japan mm -hmm. and also it has been uh, uh, tr tried mm -hmm. by the encouraged by the United States, mm -hmm. so we we can say that um, it's uh, for their common interest for mm -hmm. the three parties to in the face of security challenges in East Asia, uh, in face of North Korea and China, mm -hmm. to get a stronger alliances so that they could uh, uh, develop delve into closer security cooperation. Mm -hmm. Now let's uh, hear from Liu Dehai on the reasons behind the political and the economic reorientation between Japan and South Korea, and how the United States is strengthening its leadership in the region. He's a professor of diplomacy and director of the Center for WTO Studies in the College of International Affairs at the National Zhengzhi University. What is the significance of the economic dialogue between Japan and South Korea? in particular with respect to the evolving regional power dynamic. To what extent are the two economies intertwined? And what are the key areas of interdependence? The current uh, uh, detente of uh, Japan and uh, South Korea uh, is uh, strategically and uh, politically uh, oriented. Uh, uh, of course, we must know uh, US uh, is behind the scene because this is relevant to the uh, Sino-U.S. Uh, leadership competition in our region. So that is why uh, U.S. has uh, requested the both sides to uh, uh, tone down uh, their rhetoric and uh, to get uh, warm the relationship. In that case, uh, U.S. can consolidate its leadership in our region uh, through this uh, U.S., Japan, uh, Korea, uh, Security Alliance. Why? Because this served as the next stage competition uh, uh, in uh, San Francisco uh, APEC summit to be held in uh, November uh, this year. Uh, in that case, the uh, U.S. can move forward to get uh, the conclusion or, or, or something done relating to the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework Initiative. Uh, about uh, uh, Japan, the Korea relations, uh, 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 this time, obviously, uh, South Korea has taken the, an you know, active approach because uh, uh, Yun Suryo government wants to uh, elevate South Korea into what's so called a global people state. So in that case, Yun Suryo government has uh, cons uh, greatly consolidated its relationship with not only the United States, 
but Japan, uh, in that case, uh, I believe Yun Soryo wants to be uh, become a formal member of uh, 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 Group Seven in the forthcoming uh, uh, Hi uh, Hiroshima uh, uh, summit of the Group Seven. So that means Korea could be nominated by the United States, accepted by the host country Japan, plus the rest of the uh, Group Seven members, and then Korea can become a global player rather than original player. Uh, in terms of the economic interdependence, uh, Japan and Korea economies are more uh, competition than cooperation. In terms of uh, interdependence, yes, they do have something uh, 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 relating to uh, interdependence, in particular, the semiconductor. Uh, uh, so that, uh, so on the Abe, because uh, uh, Abe believe uh, uh, Moon Jae-in government has try, uh, tried to politicize the, the, the bilateral relationship by uh, asking Japanese companies to pay the uh, uh, compensation for the forced labor. So that is why Abe decided to impose the uh, curbs on uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, Japanese uh, 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 companies to export uh, uh, three kinds of the chemicals that are essential for memory chips and TV and the displays. Service sectors are also could be interdependent for both sides because uh, South Korea now number one uh, foreign uh, visitors for Japan uh, because uh, Chinese uh, uh, tourism are not coming yet. If uh, relations improve, more Japanese will go to uh, uh, South Korea because Japanese used to be South Korea's number one source of the tourism. Uh, so are uh, the students, exchange students or uh, you know students of, of both countries. So that's something they uh, have uh, uh, in uh, this kind of interdependent uh, relationship. Following the Kashida Yong meeting, a joint missile defense exercise will occur in the East China Sea by late May. This aim is to counter North Korea's growing new nuclear threat, particularly in response to their recent test of a solid fuel intercontinental uh, missile. The United States will also be involved in these drills. So Raymond, uh, what were the key security topics discussed during the Kashida visit to South Korea? Yeah, I think security is a major driven uh, driving force to get this uh, Korea and uh, Japan closer together. Mm -hmm. And also it's uh, noteworthy that it happens in the beginning of uh, President Yoon's uh, mm -hmm. five-year term. And uh, also they they have achieved to strengthen their security tie, including they both sides agree to exchange uh, their intelligence um, and build a regime for intelligence sharing and mm -hmm. to uh, reinvigorate uh, their bilateral security dialogues mm -hmm. and also uh, agree on the info sharing on North Korean ballistic missile launches. Mm -hmm. And those is very clear that they are facing common threat. Me immediate threat is the outlandish and uh, rogue activities of uh, Jin, 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 Jin regime. Mm -hmm. And also the ballistic missile threat. Mm -hmm. And also they are facing the uh, more remotely the uh, situation contingency of Taiwan Strait. Mm -hmm. So both, um, not only we see the very clear statement from the Japan side mm -hmm. that uh, what happened uh, in the Taiwan Strait is a matter for the security mm -hmm. For Japan, also we now see a similar talks uh, by President Yoon of South Korea, saying that uh, Taiwan Strait is uh, international water, and the free and um, uh, uh, free access to these waters is uh, very crucial for Korea as well. And uh, he also expressed strong disapproval of Chinese uh, maintenance or claim to reserve their uh, use of force mm -hmm. against Taiwan. So. Clearly, both countries, both Korea and Japan, face a common security mm. problems in face of North Korea and also more assertive uh, attitude of China. So, of course, this was also a developing that development that the United States is wanting to see mm. to has this, um, of course, American uh, forces has this basis both in Japan and Korea and also the interlinkage of uh, Korean mm. Peninsula contingency and contingency in Taiwan Strait 
It's not only very clear from the historical perspectives, it's very current in the present world. Mm -hmm. So I think the, all, the, all the more it's, um, it's uh, developing toward that direction, both to lifting the profile of alliance building mm -hmm. in okay. North sure. uh, right. area, and also for sure. the profile, lifting the profile of South sure. Korea. Okay, thank you. So Fa Yu, um, we knew that uh, President Yoon actually made a visit to the United States before his uh, you know, mutual meeting with uh, Kushida. Uh, how, how would you see you know, in what way that the United States can help to foster the you know, South Korea-Japan uh, relations given you know, they have this uh, field in the future, in the past? I think everyone is very impressive for the singing of a marine mm. pie by, by the Mr. Yoon in, in, uh, in America, right? Uh -huh. And right. well, I think the U.S. is now doing uh, what we call as an internationalization of the of the South, uh, of the Taiwan Strait mm -hmm. issue for all all over the world. So. Uh, firstly, we see uh, the Americans to uh, make some uh, diplomatic statements with the allies, like the U.S.-Japan statements, the uh, U.S. and the G7 mm -hmm. uh, statement. And now we see a lot of different in different occasions, like mm -hmm. uh, the Japan and the South Korea uh, meetings. They all also have such uh, such statements uh, concerning the Taiwan Strait issues without the presence of the U.S. So I think the U.S. has now successfully internationalized this issue and uh, include all, all, all of the allies to uh, mm. concern about uh, this area. And also, I think America is now trying to do uh, multilateral uh, institutions, like including Quad, mm. uh, AUKUS, mm. and now the Trip 4, and mm. a, a lot of different kinds of multilateral institutions mm. in order to build up a strategic competition alliance with China. So. The, so the U.S. is now pushing for a cooperation between allies and between the U.S. and, and its allies. For the uh, alliance between South Korea and Japan, maybe the target is not only North Korea, but could be also China. Who are the enemies to South Korea uh, and, and Japan alliance, according to your observation? Well, I think uh, overall it's it's a uh, it's a great power competition. Mm -hmm. So so okay. the U.S. and China is uh, without doubt the the most influential actors in this area, but also in the global politics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, in South Korea, uh, when there's uh, uh, installation of the THAAD mm -hmm. uh, a system, the defense system, mm -hmm. uh, several years ago, right. China protests <laughs> a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, that time, yeah. China thinks that oh, it's uh, it's not only for the North Korea, but but also for China. Against China, well. China yeah. So, right. so I think it's, it's in, in this world, I think it's very difficult to to differentiate what is mm -hmm. uh, the end goal right. of, of this action. Uh, action. In this episode, we delve into the historical and the present significance of the relationship between South Korea and Japan. We also explored the speculated 500 million worth of arms and provided by the United States to Taiwan. We look forward to hearing your thoughts on these topics. So please share your comments with us on YouTube channel and make sure to subscribe. Until next time, take care.